but oh, let us pray. Thank you, God, for putting challenges in our way that we have to overcome because the challenges that you give us make us stronger. They give us experience so we know how to handle things. They also help us to empathize and comfort those who have to go through the same struggles or similar issues in their lives. We thank you for the breath in our lungs today, for the good work that you are doing in this place. We ask for your blessing in everything that we do. We ask you to direct those things, whether it's what we say or it's how we act or it's what we think. We want you to lead. And you want, we want you to show us very clearly what you want from us, as well as bless us with a spirit willing to follow and submit to your authority. I pray that you would make your word alive today, this morning, that you would bless the hearts that have come here today to hear your word with newfound knowledge, newfound hope, newfound confidence in their faith. All of this we pray in your name, Jesus. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. I invite you now at this time to stand and join us in praising God. I invite you all to go ahead and have a seat. We're going to begin this morning with our look and into a reflection upon God's Word with the book of Hebrews, chapter 1. While you find your pay place on page 566 of your church Bibles, I'll tell you a little bit about this chapter in some Bible background. One of the greatest and most remarkable facts about the Bible is its claim to be the Word of God. Man isn't claiming that this is the Word of God without evidence. When we say this is the Word of God, we are basing it on what the Bible itself claims to be. This claim comes directly from it. And did you know that in the first book of the Bible, Genesis, which is one of the history books within the Bible, uses the phrase God said nine times in the first chapter alone? The Bible opens by making that claim and it closes by making that claim in Revelation chapter 22 verses 12 through 21. Next slide. That passage reads in part, Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. This is Jesus speaking to John about heaven. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in the scroll. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in the scroll. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. The phrase, the Lord spoke, appears at least 3,800 times in the New <coughs> Testament. Genesis tells us about a tree of life in the Garden of Eden that sustained life for Adam and Eve. Jesus in Revelation reveals the tree of life brought back in heaven to sustain the lives of those who make it. Let's begin Hebrews 1 1. Next slide. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. Does the church, does the church know who God's Son is? Jesus. That's right, Jesus. How many sons does God have? One. That's right. We have that baseline. That is the Bible's claim to be the authoritative and inspired word of God. Now we see that Jesus' status as the Son of God is reinforced with these opening verses. So what does that mean for us? It means that we have more reason to trust God. We have more reason to trust His Word. And in what Jesus has done for us, we can find trust and hope. Jesus was not taken prisoner and killed. He surrendered. Next slide. Verse 3. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. 
So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Jesus is not a separate or different God. He is the same God as the Father. We understand, God bless you, that God is triune, existing as a single God. But the details of how God exists is very complicated. The simplest explanation I've ever heard, which really doesn't do him justice, what it helps you to start to understand is the metaphor of a chicken's egg. So there's three parts to the egg that make it up. The shell, outer, white part, I don't know what it's called. Anybody know what the white part is called? Yeah? Let's go with the white part. Huh? Let's go with the white part. We'll go with the white part, I guess. <laughs> the yellow part of the inside we call the yolk. Okay, so we know it's the shell, the outer white part, and the yolk. I don't know, you go in the store and you want to buy just egg whites. They're called egg whites. They're not called egg placenta or whatever. <laughs> that would be pretty gross. I mean, who's going to go eat egg placenta? I digress, however. There's three different parts to the egg. <laughs> My awesome wife, ashamed of her husband, embarrassing her, talking about placenta in church. But we are that church, okay? We keep it 100 all the time. You got the shell, the white part, the yellow. All those three things make up the egg. All three of them are part of the egg, but together they form the egg. And that's a very, very, very basic, like kindergarten level, to understand God and how he exists. We're seeing that Jesus is the same as God in his being and his power. So we understand that Jesus was human and God at the same time. The Old Testament tells us that God sustains all of creation. And the New Testament uses similar wording to refer to Jesus and connects those concepts to the same being, God. Verse 4 makes an important statement because there are some, most notably Jehovah's Witnesses, and I know it probably sounds like I pick on Jehovah's Witnesses a lot, but they're the ones I know the most about outside of Christians. They believe that Jesus was the Archangel Michael. They also believe that Satan and Jesus are brothers. This verse that we've looked at here in Hebrews clearly elevates Jesus' status above angels in his being and his name. Is the devil an angel? Yes. No. Are we sure? No, he was, but he's not. A fallen angel, right? Are we sure he was an angel? Yes. Yes. I thought he was a fallen angel. Yes. Do we know a verse to support that? Or is that what the church has taught forever? I think it was in a verse. No, I, I think know. it was in Revelation. I don't know the verse. I'm pretty no. sure it's in a the verse. There's a, there's a verse that says Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. Okay. If Satan can transform himself into an angel of light, does that imply that he is an angel to begin with or not? No. No. You not still no. what you are. Do you know if Satan was an angel first? Nothing in the Bible that I'm aware of says Satan was an angel. It's it's vague. Extra biblical books say he was an angel. Right? But it's not clear. Mind blown, right? Nothing in the Bible explicitly says that Satan was ever an angel. Church tradition has taught that. Now the angels followed him into leaving God and disobeying God. That's what you're talking about in Revelation there, Isaac, is the uprising. Are there more beings in heaven besides angels and God? Yes. Spirits. Yes. Because there are other created beings. When you read some of the Bible, especially in Revelation, you see some terrifying descriptions. And I mean, if we saw what an angel really looks like, we would be terrified. It doesn't look like that cartoon that we have been shown by people. If Satan is a created being, that changes. He can't possibly be an angel. Our next verses come from Hebrew our next verses from Hebrews one are important for you to mark or take note on this issue that we're talking about. Next slide. Verse 5, for to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father? 
Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. That's Psalm 2-7, which we read two weeks ago. Next slide. Verse 7, in speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. That's Psalm 104.4. But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Next slide. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment they will be changed, but you remain the same and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? There's several quoted psalms here in this chapter besides the few that we pointed out, and maybe that's an indicator for the value of psalms. But... Does anybody disagree that this chapter is clearly establishing a difference between angels and Jesus? Saying Jesus is superior to Right, I'm saying, does anybody disagree that that's what this chapter says? No. Right? It's clear, isn't it? Everybody. So it makes you wonder, how does somebody come up with the idea that Jesus is Michael, the archangel? I don't know. I've not heard a good explanation. What I do know is that there are a few translations in the world that intentionally change things in the Bible to support what they think and what they believe instead of establishing their belief based on what the Bible actually says. We will dive, not today, <clears throat> into the near future, we'll dive into who Satan is. But for now, just know that it's one of those things, like rapture, that is never, ever listed in the Bible explicitly directly. Let's now turn to Malachi 1, which you can find on page 453 of your church Bibles. While you find your places, I'm glad you know that Malachi means my messenger. Now this is the final book of the Old Testament, but it is also the 39th book of the 66 contained within the Bible. Next slide. A prophecy. The word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I love Jacob, but Esau I have hated, and I have turned his hill country into a wasteland, and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Does God love everybody? Yes. Yeah. Let's reread verse 3. But Esau I have hated, and I have turned this hill country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Does God love everybody? No. He loves all of his people. Yes, he loves all of his people. Who are, who are his people, church? Christians. Christians. <laughs> are you a Christian? You don't know? That's okay. Auntie Christina will help you understand that. <laughs> I love your enthusiasm, Mom. So do you see in this passage more of this God says phrasing here? It opened up a prophecy, the word of the Lord to Israel. I have loved you, says the Lord, in verse 1 and 2. The Bible isn't saying Malachi is speaking as an interpreter. <laughs> He's a messenger delivering what God has said. Malachi delivers the message giving full credit to the author of the message. Not committing plagiarism here. Not stealing what God says and saying, I'm Malachi, I'm your new Jesus. I'm your new <coughs> prophet. I'm your new God. Anybody here familiar with David Koresh? Anybody not familiar with David Koresh? Okay. David Koresh was in the 90s, wasn't it? In the 90s, 
founded a cult called the Branch Davidians. Oh. The Branch Davidians compound in Waco, Texas, led to a huge altercation between them and the American government. David Koresh came along saying that he was a new prophet. He knew the Bible very, very well. And that was part of the way that he was able to manipulate people and tell, get them to believe that he was a new prophet, that he was a fulfillment of scripture. That's one of the main things you see in any cult. In anything that leads away from the word of God is an individual standing up here saying, I am a new prophet, come to you to reveal something new that's not in here. Or I'm going to give you new enlightenment about what's in here. Malachi didn't do that. Malachi writes, God says. Do you see how Israel doubts God's love? How have you loved me? What have you done for me lately? This doubt continues to exist, but God says, I have shown you my love in the promises I have kept and the actions I have taken. Next slide. It's very interesting to see that God points out his actions as a, as a sign of his love. Does anybody know what the primary love language is of men? Action. Action. I don't know exactly what it's technically called in love languages, but men primarily show their love and care, their affection by the things they do, most often in providing for their families, most often in making sacrifices for the betterment of their whole family. It's interesting that God, our Father, distinctly masculine, demonstrates his love and his actions, and that's what he points to. Verse 4, Edom may say, Though we have been crushed, we will rebuild the ruins. But this is what the Lord Almighty says, They may build, but I will demolish. They will be called the wicked land, a people always under the wrath of the Lord. You will see it with your own eyes and say, Great is the Lord, even beyond the border of his, borders of Israel. <clears throat> going to pick on them again. In speaking with a professing Jehovah's Witness recently, I asked him if he believed in hell. The reason why I asked him if he believed in hell was because it was a particularly hot day. On these particularly hot days, I called them the stay holy heat. You laugh because you know what I'm talking about. I say this is a reminder that you better stay holy because this will be your turn to be this uncomfortable hot heat. And that's not even the that's not even the tip of the iceberg for how hot hell is. He responded by telling me it's the common grave of man. So I'm like, what are you talking about? What do you mean? I asked him. He, he explained to me. And particularly, particularly after I pointed out, Jesus describes hell as being a place where you thirst for eternity, where you are consciously suffering in the book of Luke. He said he doesn't believe that a loving God would punish someone for eternity. What did Hebrews chapter 1 verse 4 just say, church? I didn't hear any. I, didn't, I heard somebody kind of talking quietly. I don't know who that was, but what did, what did verse 4 say? Yeah. That they will be always under the wrath of the Lord. How long is always? Forever. 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 Yeah. I love how smart our church is. We know so much. We deserve both stars, right? Yeah. Both star here, both star here, both star here. Yeah. Yeah, both star, for sure. Always is forever, and God says they will be under his wrath always. <clears throat> so if they will be under his wrath always, shouldn't that extend into the afterlife? Yeah. Reasonable. Does it say that explicitly? No. But it's reasonable, right? If God says you will have eternal life, that's always, right? Always and forever. So if we want to trust God to give us eternal life, why should we doubt that there will be eternal punishment or eternal death? So whenever I hear somebody say something like, I don't believe a loving God would, I always wonder, what do you mean by love? 
How are you defining love when you tell me that you don't believe in loving God will? Are you using your human standards, your heart, your world experiences to define love, to decide what a God of love is? Or did you go to the Word of God to tell you what love is and who God is, more importantly? Next week we'll begin to study the names of God. But we know today that God is righteous and He's the God of justice. So how could justice exist without punishment? If there's no such thing as eternal damnation, then why did Jesus die? Why did Jesus need to make a sacrifice? Of course, if you don't believe in Jesus' authority or Godhood, like Jehovah's Witnesses don't, they don't believe he was God, then none of that makes sense and none of that matters. Part of the reason I'm not afraid to keep talking about this is because I know there's a Kingdom Hall right nearby within 10 miles. I also know that Jehovah's Witnesses spend about a billion hours plus a year spreading their content. So I always wonder, if hell isn't permanent, then one must believe in a sort of purgatory, a place where one can do their time for their crime. Or one must be able to work off their sin in this life. See, that type of thing is called workspace salvation. And even though we live and preach the biblical truth of bearing fruit and doing good works according to our faith, we are not preaching that good works save you because that's not what the Bible teaches. We believe, live by, and teach that good works naturally flow from you when your heart changes, when you have been truly saved, also known as becoming a Christian. And that's because we believe the Bible's claim that the Holy Spirit will transform our hearts and that our lives will reflect the state of our hearts. Garbage in, garbage out. Treasure in, treasure out. Next slide, verse 6. A son honors his father and a slave his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due to me? If I am a master, where is the respect due to me, says the Lord. Says the Lord Almighty. It is you priests who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? By offering defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. Next slide. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you? Said the Lord Almighty. We thank God because of Jesus' sacrifice. Don't have to offer animal sacrifices anymore. God makes a great point here, however, by pointing out that Israel wasn't offering the best and first, to God, they were giving him their leftovers. What good is a blind animal? It's not very good. What good is a blind horse? Yeah. You'd have all the time riding a blind horse, you think? Yeah. How's the blind horse going to know you're not about to run off a cliff? How about a blind dog that you need to herd the cattle? What good is that dog? Its job and its purpose is to herd cattle, but it's blind. This is how Israel was looking at their animals. They were getting the ones that were with defects, that were defective, that were handicapped. And they were giving those ones to God instead of the best which God said to give. God takes his point at the human level by essentially saying, would you offer this to a fellow human? If you wouldn't, then why do you dis disrespect me with this pathetic offering? I am your God, not your buddy. God continues in verse 9. Next slide. Now plead with God to be gracious to us. With such offerings from your hands, will he accept you? Says the Lord Almighty. Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would 
not like useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. He would rather have nothing from you than something that is less than what he says. My name will be great among the nations from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offering will be brought to me, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. <coughs> Next slide. But you profane it by saying the Lord's table is defiled and that its food is contemptible. And you say, what a burden. And you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. See, people aren't giving God less than perfect because it's all they've got. They're giving God less than perfect because they resent having to give in the first place. They resent God's command. When you bring injured, lame, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord. Next slide. Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Our messages may have seen, may seem a little disjointed each week, but here's why. Each week I go to God to show me the book and the chapter that he wants me to focus on each week. This part of the process I go through each week to deliver what I believe God's message is for each of us. Then I study the scripture with an open heart and mind, and I allow myself to be open to whatever God wants to show me. I remain a teachable pastor teachable man, ready to accept that I was taught something wrong my whole life, or ready to accept that I came up with the wrong conclusion. And sometimes, like today, he brings a short, joking interaction that I had with someone to mind. And then he connects that to his word. We found ourselves in Malachi this morning because that is where I was led from Hebrews. <clears throat> I know that most of you probably don't understand why. I couldn't really explain it to you. It's just where I went. God's calling out those who present the task of giving an offering to God. One of the ways that the Christian provides an offering to God is with money. Money, in fact, is one of, if not the most difficult <coughs> things for us to let go of. There's so much in our lives that depend on money. There's so much anxiety and stress we have when we don't have enough money, or we're scared that we're not going to have enough money. We need it to buy food, we need it to pay for electricity, to pay for our phones, to pay for our cars, for our clothes, and a whole lot more. And I think that we, like Israel, doubt God's love for us. I think that we, like Israel, doubt that God will provide for us. That doubt turns into fear. And that fear drives us to withhold our first and best from God. I know because I've been there. When I doubt, or have doubted, that there is going to be a place so much better than this that's better than anything I can experience here, I'm tempted to withhold from God money. Why? Because I would rather spend that money on something that brings me happiness now. More than often, food. Because I don't have to cook, and I like out to eat. Who likes out to eat? Yeah. I'm mean, surprised a couple people didn't raise their hands. I knew who wasn't going to raise their hands here, but I'm surprised. So do I want to give up my latest trip to McDonald's? Because I decided to honor God with the money that he blessed me with? No, I don't want to. But sometimes you get tempted to. So I get that. And it took a long time for, for me to get to the point where I was able to be submissive to God in that area. And at first, I did it because I felt an obligation to. The thing is, God loves it when his people give with a joyful heart. Part of what he's talking about here in Malachi is that they gave with resentment. And resentment causes a rift and a problem in a relationship. So if you have resentment towards God, you're going to have distance between you and God. But when I took that step 
in that area and other areas it isn't just about money. That's what we talk about. I hate talking about money at church. But if God says we need to talk about it, we got to talk about it. Taking that step to faithfully give to God is a very scary step. But do you know what it says to God when you take that step? Anybody have an idea? You're telling Him with your heart and your actions that you are trusting Him. So if you, do you want God to deliver in your life? Do you keep asking for God, God for stuff and he, it just seems like He's not coming through? That He doesn't answer? I'm not saying, hey, give all your money to the church and God's going to give you all the blessings in the world. Because my name is Michael Ross, not Joel Austin. I'm saying that every step you take in obedience to God eventually pays off. Sometimes it pays off immediately. Sometimes it takes years. But if you want God to do something in your life, you have to surrender that to Him. You can't be like, I'm going off towards this thing that I want. God, make it happen. God, bless it. It's God, what do you want for me? I want this thing here. God's telling me to go this way instead. Do I have the faith to go that other direction instead of what I want to do? Or instead of what I think is best? If God's tugging on my heart and telling me, you need to leave that job. You need to focus on the church. I don't want to listen to you the first time, so I'm going to keep doing it. Leave that job. Go focus on the church. I'm too scared. I don't want to keep doing this. Leave that job and go focus on the church. All right, fine. I finally understand. I'm gone. Asking God to do things in your life to give you more blessings while you're refusing to give up control is the same thing is asking someone to cook a meal while you control every burner, prepare the food yourself, chopping it up, constantly go out there to see whether or not they put the lid on that pan so that it's not splashing onto your stove top, constantly turning that temperature down, micromanaging how they make that meal that they're helping you make or that you ask them to make. And then tell them to take it from there. All you've essentially given somebody is a nearly complete task. All they're expected to do now is cook the food for the right amount of time. But if you keep messing with the burner, how are they ever supposed to know how long to cook it for? So remember as you leave today that God is love. But that does not mean that He is all loving. This means that God loves us because He chooses to, not because He has to. And when you wonder about God's love, and we face tough concepts like how could a loving God allow a child to die? Remember that God's love allows us to make our own choices within the confines of His creation. God is not the reason for death, pain, and suffering. Our kids are going to learn about that a little bit next Sunday in Transformed Kids as they go through the subject of creation in Genesis 1 and 2. So parents, that's a heads up if you want to read up on that and be ready to talk to your kids about it. God is not that reason for that suffering. We cannot blame God for the things that He did not do or withhold our best from Him because we perceive that He's mean. If God isn't answering you, sometimes it means not yet. It doesn't always mean no. And God's no is not a mean no. It's no, that's not right for you. That's not the best for you. If you believe that you are in a bad situation, then you must start by coming to terms with your personal sin. You must accept that you have sinned and that you are responsible for at least some of the things that you are experiencing. But please don't misunderstand. Because nobody's saying that everything bad in your life is completely your fault. Absolutely not. We talked about crack babies last week. So I would turn around today and say that it's a child, a baby's fault that they are born addicted to something. It's not. Not everything in life is your fault. But some of it is our fault. And we can't figure out what we're responsible for and take the appropriate action if we aren't willing to start by thinking about what we have done and asking God to show us. Before you begin to look for how the sins of others have caused problems for you, start with yourself. Jesus told us he will return. So let us pray. These words from Revelation. 
Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Our community shelves are now open. I invite you at this time to stand and worship God.